Welcome to this week's episode of ShiftCast. Hootie Hoo here. We got Michael and Jens alongside me. We're going to be covering everything that has happened and everything that will happen. We've got all your news for RL Esports here. And first on the docket for today, we have the EU Regional Recap. Actually, let me get this correct. Are y'all ready? Mm -hmm. The Go European Major One Qualifier One Recap. How does that sound? It flows off the tongue, right? Oh, man. You can tell they were, they were locked <laughs> in. The creative team was locked in coming up with that name. <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of, I don't know how I feel about the whole video on YouTube, the live stream for the for the, the playoffs being called day three as well. I know, I know. Yeah, it feels like quals. And yeah, it, it is, I guess, right? It, it, they're calling it qualifier. So. I guess I, so. That's what they're doing, yeah. I don't, okay, uh, so here's the thing. I'm not really against the concept of, like, uniformity. We've got similar format every time. Yeah. You know, the... Uh, number of teams that are going to be at these international events is the same every time. So I like I, I can get that, and I also like how we are now in one calendar year. It's just RLCS 2024. Mm -hmm. That's right? the best so, part like, of the sentiment, the, format. the concepts are good, but I feel like we still could have just done like major one, regional one. Yeah, I don't think there's any problem with that. Yeah, one of I the agree. things I think about was uh, when when Liquid won and their social team was getting yelled at for not covering it. Afterwards, yeah. they said that they were the champions of Europe. And I don't think you can call yourself a champions of Europe anymore because <laughs> it's a qualifier. And I yeah, think that true, actually matters. True, like saying that you're like North, like G2, when they want to have to say they're the best team in NA, they couldn't say they were North American champions. And there's just yeah, like a okay, prestige yeah. to saying that. Yeah. And I think I miss a little bit. No, I like that. Yeah. It I don't is agree. Like, um, I think they are, they can call themselves that. It's <laughs> semantics, but I know what you're saying. It, it, yeah. It's almost like, like it doesn't make sense. The it's just, you're just a qualifier champion. champion. Yeah, exactly. You're and, still, you know, BDS. You're BDS, still winning grand finals. I mean, you are. Yeah. You're right. No, you're right. You're you're still yeah. You are, but I know what you mean. Where it just kind of feels weird because you're winning mm. a qualifier, I guess. And uh, you know, BDS they didn't make G8 last year, and then they qualified because they did so well at the World Championship. So really, the World Championship's just a qualifier as well. Just a qualifier. You remember that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everything's a qualifier. That's yeah. right. All right. So let's talk about that World Championship qualifier. We had four teams from Europe on top. We've got a uh, we've got another four course race here it is a little bit different concoction we've seen some talent move around but after this weekend i think there's no doubt left those four seem to be the strongest teams in the region and i think i mean probably the strongest teams in the world at the moment we've got the french top four we have kc bds uh vitality and gentlemates all popping off this weekend I unbelievable it last stuff week. and you know I we opened it. the show last weekend and I gave Michael a hard time. I got to eat my words now. I'm talking about a little hesitation with, I'm not sure about BDS with Exotic. I, I mean, I don't, is Juicy really going to show up? I don't know. Foot, I mean, I put my foot in my mouth. They were crazy all weekend. Yeah. And I got to, I'm going to hand the floor over to Jens real quick because he's the big winner from last episode. But I will say, <laughs> I am not, I'm, I'm not out on my moist top three prediction. But Fair. as of right now, it's looking, it's not looking good. Yeah. Not that they didn't play well, but the level that the other team showed is uh, disheartening at best. For yeah. I mean, it's Rocket League. You never know what's going That's to happen. Right. So I guess I got lucky by being the big brain last week and calling the French top four. But at the same time, I thought Vitality was still going to be on top. Um, and I wasn't 100% sure about Gentlemates, who really did show up. Yeah. So mm. it's, it's all uh, relative, but... Yeah, and obviously we're 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 gonna take some L's like that when we throw out some solid takes. But I think you know the thing is like I'm way okay holding an L when I get to watch Rocket League like that. I mean that Absolutely. was un freaking real, dude. Those semi uh, semifinal series were both so incredible. I mean BDS jumping out 3-0 over top of KC was just out of left field in my opinion. I know that BDS was good, but we saw what KC did in the quarterfinal. Granted, all those teams did, but it just I mean, everyone, everyone was saying KC clear as we roll into Sunday, and BDS just went wild. I think we got to um, highlight for a moment Drolly. First event, all kinds of right. pressure on him. And we here's what we have to do. As a community, we cannot have Zen be the bar that we are measuring against. We just can't do that. Absolutely. That's not fair to any other upcoming rookie. Zen is a special, uh, you know, a special talent, and he deserves, you know, a, a, a special piece. But what Drolly did is incredible. You know, filling in the shoes – of uh, of a team like BDS coming off of a second place finish at World, playing alongside a player like Monkey Moon, who's in that goat discussion evenly, uh, even recently. 
you know, that comes with so much pressure. And, and Drawley's also a player that we have been yapping about since he's 13 years old. So this is not yeah. like a new thing. You know, he's he's had these expectations on him for years at this point. And in my opinion, he delivered. He showed up big. Yeah. And I, I think similar to Zen, it wasn't the Drawley show. You know, I think a lot of N.A. prodigy kind of players, they show up and they try to do everything. But Drawley did, in my opinion, well, similar to Zen, and just enabled his teammates. Exotic went wild. That team looks so good. And as I said earlier, you know, my hesitation with BDS, throw it out the window. They, they are going to be top tier. That's yeah, never underrated Ex Exotic again, Michael. That's yeah, right. On that's right. On me, on me. <laughs> He's moved up over a chronic on my list for sure. Um, but I was going to say, uh, I know Drawley made some mistakes in that reverse sweep. And I really just want to say, like, as a community, like, we can't get down on the kid. He's 15 yeah. years old. And I will say, to your point, uh, Hoodie, the beginning of the tournament, you did see him doing a little, you could tell he's a ones player, and you sure. could tell he was doing trying to do a little too much, maybe to prove himself. And I was really impressed that, the, and it ha I'm guessing it was a team environment, shout out to Cassio, the coach, shout out to Monkey Moon, for kind of settling him down and playing that role, that European Rocket League that has made them the best in the world uh, as a region. Um, and so to see him grow in his play style and just a single regional, we've seen other really talented players take years to figure out how to yeah. play as a team. Uh, it was incredibly yeah. impressive. And, and I want to highlight, uh, I want to highlight Carmine as well. I mean, Batira and Rise. Um, I think, you know, I, I've, I've made, I've made a few pretty crazy predictions really early on in episodes. So I'm just going to do it again. <laughs> it just reminds me of Turbo and KDOT, man. Like just yeah. like they're on the same page. One is, 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 you know, they have different play styles, but they complement each other perfectly. And, and when they're working, um, it just feels on the pressure they put on defense is incredible. I think the most underrated part of it, though, is a Tao who, for being so mechanical, we don't recognize or realize how physical and aggressive of a yeah. player he is. And so when you have him honing in on demos and bumps, stealing boost, um, and then you have that guy, that combo of just relentless offensive pressure and defensive composure. Um, I mean, you can't even fault a team like BDS for getting reverse swept because there's only so long it feels like that you can hold up before they just unleash on you. And, uh, you know, it's 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 scary because, I mean, I looked at, I was watching and I thought, you know, there's so much incredible Rocket League going on right now and there are spots where Carmine looked better than every other team in the world by far, which is saying something considering the teams they're playing against. So, yeah, I was uh, incredibly impressed by them this weekend. Yeah, I, could, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think um, the composure from those two is just incredible. You know, that clutch factor, that ice, they're just never out. You, could, you, you know, you just never count them out. Um, let's talk about vitality, though. Jens, let me throw it over to you. Um, first loss. Yeah. Which well, first, like, let's just think about that. Average placement Kingspan. for that young man and that team after Zen joining is first place. That yeah, is crazy. insane. Yeah. They're lo his lowest placement ever in rlcs is fourth yeah or third so fourth. at the same time you can say it was always going to happen right that's right it was it, he, you can't win everything forever although that's right. they tried pretty hard <laughs> they were doing their best <laughs> they succeeded sure. pretty yeah. well but um i love the call that you made earlier saying how drali was playing with his team more mm -hmm. than making it a drali show and i watched the series back uh again today and i just have to say that zen was playing more like a zen show like i oh, yeah. missed vitality's team play more than anything and i feel like the lack of someone like zen was actually beneficial to gentle mates right i feel like what gentle mates were doing was not relying on individual brilliance and playing as a team because that's what they have they have the team players in the, in their roster right yeah. they don't have a zen to step up and every time zen tried to make those solo plays to go for those incredible mechanical plays he was just getting shut down even in the games that they had in that they were in control even the games where it was 3-0 for vitality every time zen went for a solo play he got shut down it was the passing plays it was alpha setting up uh, yeah. some assists for, for his teammates. Uh, that's what made the difference in those games. So 
I feel like they really have to consider their playstyle more than anything. And they have to go back back to the drone board with Fairy Peak and, and see like what can we do to be less predictable, less dependent on those solo plays, because that's why, how they got shut down. Yeah. I also think that it's fair to say Radosin didn't have his greatest event. Sure. I think he was a little lacking in, in some games. And some games he showed up good, but that, that inconsistency will definitely be punished once you get to that top four. And despite yep. all of that, they still should have won. I mean, they're up yep. by one with 10 seconds left. And, and, you know, maybe we should dedicate an episode to this because I have been a, a, a kickoff enjoyer from, <laughs> like, 2017. I used to coach oh, Rocket League, man. and I was, like, obsessive about it. I had this huge spreadsheet with percentages of, like, where the ball went for each player and everything. Like, I, I, I just – I come from the sports world. And in Money the sports ball. world, if you have the opportunity to run a set piece, you're going to take advantage of it. And I don't mean that you have to go all out in, like, a fake kickoff because we got to score every time. I don't mean that. But, like, it needs to be intentional and thoughtful – and when you have a goal lead with 10 seconds left, yeah. maybe, just maybe, you design a play that's a bit more conservative, that's a bit more cautious. Maybe Instead you of want alpha, to prioritize. Just flipping onto the field. Yes, maybe you want to prioritize protecting the net. Maybe, and hey, maybe I'm wrong, but maybe, just maybe, picking up two pads, 70, 80 boosts, and staying remotely close to the net, maybe that's something to entertain. So you hold yep, yep. on to your one goal lead for the final eight seconds. I don't know. Maybe. But You're we'll right. See. It was incredibly close, and Vitality should have taken it, could yes. have taken it. Yep. At the same time, I felt like Gentlemates kind of deserved to win more in the way they played. Sure. Like, they were the team to really stay in control. Even in the games they were losing, they, they could you know, get a, a hand over, over Vitality. I, I feel like, even though it was so close, if, especially when you're watching it back, right, and you already know who's going to win, and you just watch it game by game, you see, like, there's something there with Gentlemates that they yeah, yeah. really, really nailed. They absolutely did. They, they look so good, and, and I like how you brought up their, their team play. It feels like that's just, like, an Itachi effect. It feels like wherever he goes, there's just this incredible cohesion on the field between his teammates. Um, and obviously, that is present here with this Gentlemate squad. It's going to be super exciting to watch. Um, let's go on to the next one, which is going to kind of hurt my heart. Oxygen missed the playoffs outside the top eight. Can they still make land? Uh, I'm going to say know. yes. Okay. I'm say yes. And I'll say this because of this. Um, I think it's really important for them to realize this as well. The yeah. difference in points between a top eight and a top nine to 11 is one point. Right, um, I think the sort of win condition to make LAN is probably two top fours, which does not look easy in Europe, but they have the ability to do it with the talent on their roster. Yeah. And I think it's going to be very important for them as a team, whether it's the coach or you know the players themselves, to realize that a 9th to 11th is not the death sentence that it feels like. That's a yeah. mental hurdle that you have to take. When you look at the, when you look at the, um, look at the standings, they're only one point behind four teams. Right. So mm -hmm. if they can rebound, get a top four, make another top four, which, like I said, it doesn't look like there's a lot of room up there, but yeah. they definitely have the players to do it. Um, they they can make land. And so I think for them, it's more about listening. Hey, that wasn't our best showing. But we obviously like, you know, we, we have the team to do it. we got to put that behind us. we got to start grinding again and we can find uh, we can find success in those top fours and make land. I don't think it's I think if you honestly, if you finish like, oh, three, I think it might be over. But anything other than that, the point differential between top eight and top nine, eleventh, and twelfth, fourteenth is not big enough to make as much of a difference as people may think it would. Gens? Um, I mean, I just think the top teams are so strong that those top fours that you're talking about are much harder to come by. If it was like NA, if it was North America, and you had a team like Shopify Rebellion making top four, and then not even making the top 16, right? Um, I'm sure we, we get back to that later. Um, if it was like that, if there were teams like Shopify Rebellion, who you'd expect to do well, but could falter, then sure. But I don't see any of those top European teams above Oxygen. Oxygen is a top European team as well, but the ones above them, I don't see them falter at the moment. Yeah. I... I am conflicted. Like, I still, obviously, I, I, I hold on to faith, and, and I know that those guys, you, you're right, Michael, they played 
just really poor Rocket League on the day. They definitely have to play better than that if they want a chance at it. But I'm also with Yens. Like, those top four really do look clear of the rest of the pack, and it doesn't look close. The only thing that I think I will hold on to hope for is the pure chaos that this structure allows. I mean, if yeah. we think about it, Gentlemates was one series off of missing top 16, right? Like, they got You're knocked so to lowers. Deep too. Um, and, and, and anything can happen. I mean, we saw it, and as you just said, we saw it in North America, TSM versus Rebellion. You had, a, 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 I think it was a top 14 team versus a top four team to make it into the event for qual number two. Yeah. And so, you know, anything can happen. I also think if Oxygen is going to do this, they have got to be immaculate in the Swiss. They cannot put themselves in a position where they're going to be having rough matches in round two and round three. They need to, be, they need to start this thing off like 3-0. They need to be in a good spot so they're getting the favorable matches moving forward. Um, and, and I think ideally they want to move through the Swiss stage in a 3-0 or a 3-1 fashion. That way, they again, they get that more ideal matchup, trying to avoid those top four at the very least. Um, and it's, I mean, the reality is it's definitely going to be difficult. I think Yen said it right. That top four, you know, maybe they're sniffing the top eight, and maybe that's not a big difference, but that top four is going to be really, really difficult if those yeah. teams all play to the ability that they can uh, because, I mean, they put on a show this weekend, and, and I think not just Oxygen, Moist, Magnifico, Team 3, whoever over there, they're going to have a tough, tough task to try to break into that top four. And, um, I mean, one of the things we talked about in a previous episode, though, is similar to your point with the Swiss, you can catch better teams early, just the nature of early regional stuff, especially in Europe. Yeah. So it is going to be crucial because <laughs> securing, playing, you know, no disrespect to Magnifico or Team 3, they played very well, end point. But you would obviously rather play them than have to go up oh, the yeah. top eight against one of the four teams that made the semifinal. Yeah. And so if you can steal a game or steal a series over a, a Vitality or a Gentlemates or a Carmine early in the, in, the, in the regional before they really get going, that can be such a difference maker. So mm -hmm. I totally agree. Swiss has to be immaculate. And if they do that, I think they'll give themselves a shot. But yeah, if they're going 3-2 into the playoffs, having to face one of those giants, yeah. it's going to be a you know, massive mountain to climb. That's right. All right, well, before we get off of this EU regional recap, we have got to touch on the incredible viewership. I don't know if y'all saw, uh, Bob tweeted out this morning, peak concurrent viewers for NA, 92,000. Peak concurrent viewers for Europe, 430 plus. Yeah. I mean, 4X? That is insane. Gentlemates, uh, y'all correct me if I'm wrong here. Gotaga, is that how I say it? I believe so, yeah. Gotaga, yeah, yeah. 157,000 watching his stream. 134,000 watching Kamito's stream as well. What even is that? That's, that's like world championship numbers for a quality. It, it almost a, a broke regional. the record. It almost broke the world championship record, I believe. It was, they were like 10K off. I mean, yeah, for a regional, for a, yeah, a regional what? event. We're not talking lands, we're just talking regional events. So far out ahead, yeah. So uh, the the one thing I want to say, and, and sorry for interrupting there, Michael. I no want worries. you, the the people listening here, put a pin in this point. Okay, hold on to this point. We're gonna come back to some other stuff later on and talk about some format, RLCS, etc. But I want you to remember how important these organizations are. They are bringing massive, immense viewership, and it's not only people that are interested in Rocket League. I promise you, there are people on these huge streams that have never viewed Rocket League before, and they're seeing it for the first time. And, you know, not all of them are going to convert to be fans, but some of them will. Um, and and, and a, a ton of them will continue to support their favorite creators, um, org, and team. And so it is important to not only care for the players, not only care for the fans, but also try to strike a balance and care for these orgs. I just want to put a pin in that because I want you to remember what these orgs can bring to RLCS as we talk to, the, uh, to that point later on. Yeah, it's those yeah, creators' well. orgs in general, right? It's not even just France. It's not even just That's Europe. Right. You have uh, Moist with uh, Moist Critical, Charlie. Uh, whether you like him as a streamer or not, he is putting a good word in for Rocket League Esports. He really is. Yep. I, I just want to say quickly, Toast, my boy. You see those yeah. numbers? Disguised. Come, Come over now. here. I saw it, you know. <laughs> Get a team. I know you want. I listen. There's a lot of good European teams that could use an org, and 157k <laughs> sounds pretty good to me. That's some nice ad revenue. So. You just That's need right. to pay three players instead of five for your Valorant exactly. rosters. Exactly. Uh, I just, I'm just gonna float that out there. You know. 
Okay, and next up, we're going to be interviewing Triton. We're going to talk with the rookie to RLCS. Off to a great start, a team member of, uh, a pl excuse me, a player of the team, 100%. Triton, welcome to the show. How are you feeling this uh, afternoon? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Excited to be here and to talk about the team and the results. Absolutely. We appreciate you joining us, man. So we'll just open it up. I mean, rookie, walking into RLCS, first event, you get the world champions, Vitality, the prodigies in, and you beat them. What on earth does that feel like? Yeah, I mean... It was it was a really really weird one because going into the match we kind of like expected a fall off from Vitality because like I know especially Crispy on a, on my team he was saying like out of all of the top teams Vitality is probably the one that you can get a series off of and we were just really confident going into it and once we got to game five it was just pure passion from there like once we put ourselves in the opportunity to in the position to get the spot to win the series we just took it. Yeah, it was it was really really strange. I didn't really expect it, but kind of hoped it would happen. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, you had to fight off the team in game four and get the win in overtime to even make it to game five, and then you win. Like, how does that even happen? Yeah, I mean, in game four, I think it was like a two minute two minute overtime. He scored a passing yeah, play. I yeah. mean, we barely held on. I mean. It, it wasn't like a it wasn't like a weak performance from us, but it was just they weren't really pressing us, and we kind of realized at that point we kind of have to take control of the series ourselves. Otherwise, we are just gonna get we're just gonna get beat in game four when we really shouldn't have. It was kind of the same as like uh, it's kind of the same as uh, in our KC series after we lost the first two two games, we kind of realized we need to step it up. Otherwise, we're just gonna lose. We can't play too passively. We have to actually just go for it and take the win rather than just expecting it to come to us against these top teams. It's just never gonna happen. Fair enough. Um, and on, on that note, sort of, you mentioned that you said that Vitality of all the top teams were, or at least Crispy thought that they were the team that you guys could steal a series off of. What, is there any specific things, maybe scrims or the way they play versus the way you guys play that indicated that, or was it just kind of a feeling of, you know, they're the world champions. There's maybe a history of world champions not being that great the season after, if they don't make a roster change that, uh, made you guys feel really inspired that you could, you could take that series. Um, I don't think it was anything specifically. It was more the thing like we heard how much and we saw how much how hard other teams were grinding and from Vitality it seemed like they were on, like a lower level because I mean they already won worlds with ease, they won the major, they did everything. They've effectively completed like every single tournament they can win. So they weren't going for it as hard as other t other teams and we've been grinding really, really hard for the past like four months or so. As soon as we formed, we haven't really taken many breaks and just seeing uh Seeing how much they were doing compared to us, we thought we had a chance at it. So you wanted it more, huh? Yeah, basically. <laughs> I mean, that that more passion. Well, that, that brings up a good point. You said it's been about four or so months of, of grinding. And so take us through how this 100% team formed, kind of the off-season. Were there any other options for you specifically or, or your teammates? And, and, um, and then from there, like once you guys did lock in, you know, how did you guys feel about growing into, uh, you know, hopefully a top 16 mainstay team? Yeah, so I got quite um quite fortunate with this team because this was my best option. It was the one I hoped to get onto because I had a couple of tryouts, but nothing I was really as happy with um than this team because I'm I was good friends with Crispy before the team as well, and we we talked and etc. And he said it, I'd get a try and get an opportunity, but the thing is, I have a lot less experience than a lot of people they try out with. I know they tried out with Catalyst, they tried out with a lot of different thirds, and they played a lot of tournaments with different people, but um. When we played, whilst we were still trying out, we played the Hercules tournament, which we managed to win, which was a nice little win over, I can't remember who it was, I think it was Nas Rizir's Ivan, and I think we also beat Team 3 in it, so it was quite a good way to solidify like our results and see that we can actually do something, we have some potential on this team. Um, but yeah, it was definitely my best option, and I think I think that kind of good scrim results in that tournament win kind of helped us uh, like properly form together. And yeah, I, uh, then we picked up Flame after, and it was a good idea, but yeah. I, I was going to say, one of the things that I love about specifically European Rocket League is that it feels like the different sort of languages all have their own communities. And I feel like the English community is the funniest one. Like you got, there's so many like memes and so many colorful characters, Rise, Archie, even like Crispy's kind of a meme within the English community itself. You saw with like, the Hogan Mode streams last year. Uh, talk a little bit about how you know, being part of that scene has helped you grow as a player and, and how 
you know, the, the environment that they create from the top to the bubble um, as a kind of English community? Yeah, I mean, you're very right. Like every different country has its own community. And then within these communities, there's sub communities. And yeah, it's very true. I mean, I'm I've used to play quite like a decent amount with Joy and Rise back in like this is back in like 2021 because we were close friends. We just played stuff just in general. But since they're two very, very accomplished players, I mean, at the time they were just very high in school, didn't have really proved what they've done. But definitely playing with them and being able to talk to them throughout my entire career has definitely helped me improve. I think it's a very underrated thing. I mean, connections in this game mean a lot because there's going to be a lot of players who will have the talent and they won't have the tryouts or the opportunities or that kind of thing. And I feel like it definitely helped me improve to become the player I am today. And yeah, that's, yeah. I'm just going to chime in here and say for any of our young listeners, um, that sentiment there is pretty true in all human experience. Those connections yeah. will definitely help Network. you land positions there. And, and it's not like a... It's just it's just how it goes, you know. Sometimes there are are immensely talented people or people that work very hard that, you know, they maybe don't get discovered or, or get the opportunity that they may deserve. So, yeah, I could I could definitely see how that would be super helpful. But we got one final question here. We want to ask you: the Swiss stage was chaotic. Round one, we had um, let's see here, we had Vitality uh, lose, BDS lose, Oxygen lose, and Moist lose all in round one. So Europe always delivers the chaos, but. When you have those early losses in Swiss from top level teams that probably shouldn't be losing that early, it makes the rest of the Swiss just a mess, quite frankly. So we had some teams that had some really, really rough runs, and we want to ask you your opinion. Who had the worst run, uh, the most difficult run of these three teams? We have Su. They played Carmi Corp, Vitality, Oxygen. They got 03 in the event. We had your team 100%, which is Vitality, Carmi Corp, BDS, and then Fast Forward. And then we had Redemption who played Wild, Gentlemates, Vitality, and Moist. So of those three runs, which do you think is the least desirable? Which is the most difficult run between you, Redemption, and Su? I mean, I, th I think it's kind of like, it's no-brainer that ours was the hardest. We played, we played, if you saw, if you watched any BDS over this weekend, they were playing insane. Exotic was really, That's really fair. just popping off. I mean, KT Vitality BDS is my top three in the region. Like, it doesn't, I don't really... I feel like Gentlemates had a really, really good like showing this um, this regional, but we'll see if they can make those grand finals uh, consistently. Um, Sa so played Vitality, KC, then Oxygen. I mean, Oxygen didn't even make the top eight. I mean, they weren't playing well. I mean, I watched some of their games. They're they're a top team for sure, but it wasn't their day. And Redemption, Redemption played a lot of lower level teams to go O2, and then kind of worked their way up. Um, they they played Moist, and they also did play Vitality, but. They didn't have to go for like a KC or a or a BDS. I think yeah, that's I'd, fair. I'd agree. Yeah, I'd agree. I think that's it's... fair. I mean, uh, Vitality, KC, and BDS were all top three. And if you if you are of the opinion that those are your top three teams in the region, I, I think that's pretty fair. I mean, uh, General Mates, they, like you said, they did have a good showing, but they went toe to toe game seven with Vitality. So I definitely I definitely think that's a fair fair uh, assessment here. Well, that's all the uh, all the questions that we've got for Triton. Does do you guys have anything before we let him go? Yeah, I got one. Um, so obviously, great first performance. I think you proved that you guys are absolutely a competitive European team in the toughest region in the world, it looks like by far. Uh, what, where do you see? What's, what's the goal for 100% for this split and beyond? For this split, I think it's important to just make every single regional. Like we've just seen in NA, Spot, uh, Shopify didn't even make the second regional after coming top four, which is literally insane. So first of all, we just need to make every single one. And we're going to go from there, but hopefully we can get at least one top eight. If not, go two, three in the next regional and then after top eight, because I think that's going to give us a good push for the next split where we can hopefully push for top fours or even a major. But that's kind of where I see it. I want to know what your future holds as well, because you say you got the connections, so <laughs> you're getting picked up by a bigger team. Uh, what's going on? Um, by, co by connections, I, I mean, I'm friends with a lot of these people, but it's like, it's... I'm. I'm very happy with the team we're currently. I think I see a lot of potential, like beating Vitality, going game five of KC in my first regional. I know I had nerves. I mean, this is Crispy's first main event win as well. Breezy had a lot of experience, and I'm really lucky to have like Flame around us as well. It's such an underrated, um, such an underrated coach to be around us in that environment because they have so much experience behind them. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty happy where I'm at right now. I think we could do really, really well. I'm not really interested in going anywhere else, but who knows what the season has and what's gonna happen in the future but All right. i'm excited All right. where it is right now good man good high hopes we love to hear that 
Uh, well, before you take off, Triton, if you've got any shout outs you want to make or anything you want to say before we uh, let you head on your way. Um, no, not, not really, nothing really. Just make sure to keep watching our RCS. Hopefully you'll see us in top eight and on the playoff um, championship Sunday at some point. But yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for having me. Incredible. Well, y'all stay tuned with 100%. They got big stuff in the future. Triton, thank you again for joining us, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, we're going to close that up. And the next thing that we have is next up rookie of the week. So we are going to be selecting our standout next up player for this EU open qual. And I'm going to throw this over to Michael first. Um, who do you have as your standout next up player? Well, you know, I know this is going to be a shock to everybody. Shock. But I'm going to take, I'm going to pick Drolly as my next up, yeah. um, next up rookie of the week. I mean, what else can you say? We talked about it earlier. He got better throughout the regional. You know, he looked completely like, you know, he's going up against most players who were considered the best in the world last year. He didn't look all, uh, out of sorts, didn't look out of place. My apologies on on the field. I mean, he, he's he been known as a top prospect for years, and he delivered. And I think, you know, we saw what happened to BDS last year when they had a slow start. It just, it didn't it didn't come back until they were made a change and added a uh, you know, super elite player. And I think it was really important for them to get off to a strong start and, and for the team in the org to know that they have a team that can compete and go and make major finals and win majors. And they hinged a lot on this young kid. And yeah. some kids would crumble. Some kids would try to do too much. And throughout the weekend, he proved that he belongs at the top of Europe. So, I mean, he's at the top of the, the next dot rankings for a reason. I believe he's third or second. Um, and that's, you know, he's proved every moment of it, and I can't wait to see him continue to grow. Gins. I'm going to represent the Netherlands here, because I do be Dutch, and pick a really, I guess, an underdog rookie in Europe, in Temper, who uh, was playing for Belly Gold alongside Speed and Hyder, and uh, he was on our first iteration of the next up uh, campaign for shift and he's just taking games off of vitality off of moist and with speed on your team in 2024 <laughs> oh, no. i'm uh, not throwing too much shade but that's an achievement that's an achievement it is i agree so for me that's my standout player even though it didn't get past swiss uh still made it to round five i mean i'm impressed let's go temper um, obviously plenty of rookie talent in Europe and, and all over the world, actually. Uh, but I, I got to go with Drolly as well, alongside Michael. Uh, it is the boring, it is the boring, obvious one. But I have so much respect for these players when they have, you know, just huge shoes to fill. And they step up to the challenge and immediately meet it. I think it's something that, uh, no matter how empathetic you may feel, I don't think you will ever fully grasp how, like, how much weight that is on them and how difficult it is to actually achieve uh, um, you know, uh, an adequate performance, really, because you know, you just, like, players like that, they know if they are not incredible, they are going to be criticized heavily um, all across the board, Reddit, Twitter, streams, wherever. And so to have that kind of pressure on you, playing alongside Monkey Moon, playing for an org like BDS, playing against all kinds of incredible competition um, in Europe and, and rising to the occasion, a lot of respect for that, uh, for the young man, Drally, and he's got a He's got a bright future. I'm sure he will be a winner for a very, very long time. Yeah, just uh, just quickly, I want to shout out. I know we just interviewed him, but Triton as well. Um, oh, yeah. Absolutely phenomenal debut performance. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we'll be seeing him a lot. Uh, one more thing about Drolly. Listen, that's that's just how Canadians are built, you know? And okay, I'm going to call God. him a Canadian because <laughs> okay, he, it says it on his Wikipedia, <laughs> but J Nap, Squishy, Pop 4, uh, Major Illusion. It's just how we are, so I'm not surprised at all. Okay. Alongside all right. Crispy as well, another rookie. Yeah. To to um, get they've been they've been around and, and they they've shown why they deserve to be, you know, members, people who have been knocking on the door for for years now. So yep. shout out to them. Exciting times for uh, the fans of upcoming talent. I know that I certainly am. I love to see new players emerge and, and get their opportunity and then uh you know, do do their thing, like Triton taking down Vitality. What a what a fun thing and and a confidence builder, surely. Um, next up will be something that we will return to each week. So y'all stay tuned for that. I'm excited to keep tabs on these rookie players for the season. 
Next up, we've got regional previews for next week qualifier for North America, South America, MENA, OCE, APAC, and SSA, and we'll go in that order. So let's go ahead and start with NA. we got plenty to talk about here. NA depth, question mark, or what we think? It's what are you over. thinking, Michael? It's over. It's just over. It's like It's over. <laughs> listen, fundamentally, we have it. Listen, I, I actually, okay, I'm going to be a little, let me be positive, all right? I am a voter on the Shift 16 that everybody loves and no one ever has a problem with. And uh, I did have G2 as the fourth best team in the world. I had them above exactly one uh, European top four team because I think outside of the flashes of just complete domination that Carmine showed, and I want to shout out to CJCJ as well because it's always a good thing to shout out him, but he did a really, really good replay review on his YouTube. You guys should go watch some CJCJ YouTube. He's great um, about G2's play style. And I really was impressed of how they really emphasize their first two kind of up players cutting to help their third man. Um, it does leave some transition opportunities, but it really makes them, uh, it counters a midfield heavy play style very well because there's constantly players cutting back to stop that sort of forming of, of midfield pressure. Um, and, I, and I think obviously they didn't face the toughest competition, especially Gen G's lackluster performance, but they had a game plan, they executed it and they stomped everybody with it. And I, I have to give them that. So I still think G2 is incredible. I think Gen G will figure it out. I think there are a few other teams. Uh, I'm not going to count out LJ. I'm not going to count out. Uh, I think Dig has shown that they are a model of consistency. And I think M80 showed that they have a great peak. But, I mean, you can't look at those qualifiers and not be extremely questionable about the talent and the, the play styles and, and, and the overall quality of North America, you know, now that it feels like they're far closer to Sam and Mina than they are Europe uh, as a top to bottom region. I mean, we always talk about how, like, oh, NA actually has, like, a pretty strong like four to nine but like do they i mean none of these teams could would probably be counted on to even win a series out of land except if they played apac or ssa and i i can't sit here and pretend even though i really want to pretend that i have any faith in anybody other than gen g g2 gen g m80 and i think i would give dignitas a puncher's chance because they play so solid and i think arsenal is playing some of the best rocket league in the region right now um, in terms of his ability to enable and disrupt. So, yeah, I'm just, I'm getting so close to just abandoning it. I'm not going to, but, you know, like I said, no more Canadians. But, no Michael, you sound so defeated. I am defeated. It's over, dude. It's over. We had a good <laughs> what run. Do you we mean had seven it's years. Over. <laughs> what, what do you mean over. it's over? It just started. I, it's over, dude. Justin I, isn't it's playing. It's lovely to watch those European regionals, but I want some competition. I want to see the European greats go up against American greats. Wh what's happening, question, Michael? I have a question for you. Yeah, it's a question. How many teams right now, how many players in sure. North America currently do you think could would get a roster spot on one of those top four teams? I mean, I, I agree that it's looking really grim, but Eight? you sound defeated. You sound like you're giving up. Where's the USA? USA. I'm not from the USA. <laughs> Where is I'm part of the crown. Okay, I'm damn near English at this point. <laughs> Toronto crazy. boy. You yeah, know what man. I mean? Yeah. I want this passion from North America. Where is it? That's what keeping Europe so strong. And and you've done it before. NA has battled that strong fight back to make it into the lands and get into semifinals and finals and even cloud nine winning that re that uh that world that was amazing that's what we want to see but wait, I want your, like... it pains me to see north america in this state i saw one comment on on reddit and i know it's just one reddit comment but i think this represents a part of the uh, north american fan base what said G2 and Gen G can definitely definitely reach top eight, which is pretty good. Pretty good. Top eight. That's... Pretty good. What what kind of mentality is that? <laughs> it sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> like, but what I, are you I fighting say, for? You want to win? I will, I will defend North America on this. Um, I feel like people are jumping to put other regions besides Europe on top. And I mean, I watched uh, the best M uh, MENA team last year go to World Championships with their prodigal 16-year-olds get stomped by a 24-year-old Jay Naps and then also get sweat or 4-1 by Space Station. I still think they're the second best region. I just think that they're closer to the to the two sort of most emerging regions than they are Europe because um, I don't think they consolidate talent very well outside of the top two teams. I think there's a lot of standouts that are stuck on teams that aren't don't have as high a ceiling. 
Um, I don't think that the, the talent's developing. You talked about um, when NA was really competitive around, I would say, season six to eight plus like yeah. nine. I think G2 would have done well. X and then 21, 22. Yeah. Well, think about the players that were coming up in season seven. Reddles, Arsenal, AJ, Mist, Atomic. First killer join in, in yeah. season eight. That's sure. six players that for the last four years have been internationally competitive. I know Reddles, he hasn't been to as many lands, but he was internationally competitive as early as a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah. Where, like, outside of, like, LJ? I mean, we had Daniel Beastmo beat Daniel Beastmo, but they, they were kind of like, in, they, they, Beastmo was around, then he retired, he came back. Daniel was a one-off thing. We haven't had a, quote-unquote, golden generation of players for four years. And I think there's some deep-seated stuff, but I'm going to pass it over to Hootie. Or, he seems like he has an answer for this. Your golden era is coming. All right? Okay. It's coming. You're right you that that mid-level has been fairly stagnant. I also think you're right about, at least to some degree, about the um, talent consolidation. I would actually argue that NA did a pretty good job, but the problem is there's just not a ton of it, right? Like, we put it all on those two teams and then everything else. I mean, you've got Justin, who's great, and Two-Piece, who's great. I don't think Parth is a slouch. You know, if we're looking at that team and we're thinking like those two there. could be a top four, except Parth is in the way, I don't think that's true. So here's the thing. Those are good players, but if you want to be considered a contender for international events, there's, you just cannot miss top 16s. You can't in your own region. That's, not, that's, not, that's unacceptable. You look at Space Station, LJ, world-class talent. I think Chicago and Hawks are, are good pieces as well. But, I mean, look around in a, like, if we're, if we're saying like LJ deserves better, well, I mean, who are we going to throw on there? I don't think that there's a ton of talent that's better than Chicago and, and Hawkser. And so, and I'm not trying to knock anyone, but I do think that you're right about that mid-level has just kind of, and I don't think complacent's the right word, but they haven't really surged upwards. You know, I think um, <clears throat> Europe has seen talent surge upwards. The full original Queso roster, you got Seiko who has surged upwards. Exotic has become an incredible player. Liquid, you got Asi Atau. So there's been a lot in the last two years surge forwards. Whereas NA, not so much. And so what has been incredibly talented, they've shoved them onto two teams, and those two teams, as long as they play well, um, I, I think a top eight, like they should make a top eight at international events. Yeah, I, sure. I, I, I do agree that those top four in Europe look stronger, but those two in NA are going to be good teams. Those are solid, yeah, solid of players. Course. But you need, what, what, like you but, said, you need those teams surging up to also inspire rookies to get it's new coming. players it, coming up. It's coming. We just, yeah. they, they have so little experience. They need time. The mechanics are there. If you go looking, some of these players, um, you know, they, they just have, I mean, frankly, better car control than a lot of the top eight players. And I know that car control is only one aspect of being a competitor. You've got to have that mentality. You've got to have that hunger. That's something that Yanz was talking about, like the attitude. You can't give up just because you failed a couple of times. You can't, and Michael, you talked about it earlier with oxygen. You can't give up because you missed out on the top eight, right? Like that, that fire, that passion. And so, Will these players that have all this mechanical ability, will they have those intangible things that you can't really measure? I don't know. But I do, I do hold hope for NA fans for the future. It may not be this season, but you're going to have to hold on because you've got YWS. You've got Snowman. You've got TSM upcoming talent. You've got, um, you know, some of these teams like this. Uh, this CRL team is not like, they're not new upcoming talent. But those teams performing problem, yeah. better consistently is going to push everything up, right? You've got Cam, Taroko, Daunt. Them continuing to improve their performance, again, is going to raise that level across the board. So I think for a long time, you know, there was this discourse about NA, Bubbles trash, you know, or, or the players were saying Bubbles trash, and everybody else was saying Bubble needs chances. And I think it was just kind of in between where the Bubble wasn't really pressing the top. If I'm one of those top six teams, and I'm dominating everybody outside of the top six, why would I pull somebody? I mean, like, yeah. I'm already being them, you know? I'm already doing that. So, I mean, I kind of see all the different angles. I see why the top-tier talent gate kept. I don't think that's what they were doing. But I think that's why – I see why they didn't really move and rotate talent mm -hmm. from the bottom because the bottom wasn't threatening. Now we're starting to see the t tippity top has all consolidated, and now that four through eight is exposed, and the bubble is getting a little bit better. They're starting to threaten. We've got some new upcoming talent as well mixed in there. So if you are an NA fan – you may have to suffer yeah. through a little bit longer. Yeah, but there Things is some emotion. There's some hope at the end of the tunnel, I think. I, I hold the same hope. I do think that they can come back from this. But I Sunday night at half past three in the morning, I was watching uh, Shopify Rebellion struggle against Steve Aristo. 
um, energy fighting off Muffin Man. I was having a bad dream. Yeah. I don't know what I was seeing. Yeah. It, yes, I hold out hope, Bowl. but this is not it. No, I agree. I, I agree. It is yeah. rough right now. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to remain rough. I think, one, there is some inconsistency. But two, the, the volatility of this format is going to highlight it. Absolutely. So, you know, these these occurrences are, are it's not a one-off thing. I think we're going to see, it may not be the same teams every time, but I think we'll continue to see it in NA. And I, I you know, I'm going to choose to look at it as, you know, a positive. We've got some, you know, some fresh talent that, you know, is maybe pushing these teams a little bit, knocking them out. Um, and hopefully we'll inspire everyone to in, improve their game. And and we get the end goal like Jens is hoping for, where we're actually competitive again with Europe at international events. I just want to say one more thing, which is I think the coaching needs to get better in North America. Um, and I don't know actually what coaches do, so I don't know. But I look at, uh, I mean, the young talent in Europe, I feel like is often comes along with great coaching. And I look at the coaches at the top of NA, and they're all, a lot of the coaches in, in, at the top of NA are former pros and former very good pros, as well as Europe. Obviously, Farah, Fairy Peak, Casio, all really, really good players in their day. Um, I look at, the, you know, Sathew, who was really solid. Alu was really, really good. So, you know, it would be great to see some of the older players that were in North America come out, maybe pick up or join a team of younger players and, and really teach them, like, what made them great. Because I, I, while the mechanics change, I don't think the te- things like team environment, team culture, you know, staying mentally uh, ready for games, not getting complacent, that's stuff that across all sports, digital and, and, and physical and, and across all competition stays the same. And so I would love to see some of the, the greats the same way that some that it's happening in Europe now come together. I mean, we, we talked to Triton about it. He said flame was super underrated and he's a great coach. And uh, I think that that matters. I think that matters in, in the long run. So I would love to see, I mean, I would love to see some of the, the, the old guard come out and, and really show uh, some of the younger players, the extra stuff that it takes to go from mechanically talented product, like prospect to, Full-fledged pro. And even more than that, I want to see them standing behind their players. I want to see the players in the same room. I want to yeah, boot camping see them to look. I want to see them look at EU and copy what works there. And boot camping, being in the in the in the same space while you're competing, is something that works really really well for those European teams. So that's something complexity. Uh, complexity last season most of the time where at least two of them were were in the same room and, and they looked mm-hmm. like the best team in north america by the end yeah the that's year. something that's so easy uh, to copy at, and do better i look at one more thing before we move on i look at arsenal and the way he's come back i know because there was a moment there the last year where it looked like he might be trending downward and he's come back and i look at the st- kind of stuff he says where it's about a lifestyle it's about you know being active and 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 keeping your mental good it's about not having crazy expectations not letting the game get to you it's about grinding he's playing on eu servers he's watching eu replays and he's an older player so he's a lot more mature but it's stuff like that that i think you know he's come back and is one of the best players in the region right now i think for that reason because he realizes that there's functional issues within north america and he's trying to set the tone for his team he's got a europe a legendary european player as his coach and he's helping kind of bring that play style to north america and and dig has shown that with that play style it looks like they're you know they're I think where people thought their talent was earlier, early in this year versus the now results are, are showing. So I think that, Jens, you're completely right in that, that it's not like they're doing something secret voodoo magic over there. Like, you can change it. Um, and I think it'll be important to, for the teams to go forward uh, to, to learn how to, how to copy that sort of uh, routine that they have out there. All right, one final quick question. We'll get this fire, uh, rapid fire here from you guys. For um, N.A., We'll just revisit. Who do we think is top four? I see right here in the docket we've got Dig, SR, but obviously Rebellion missing the main event. Uh, so I just want to see what you guys have. Michael, obviously, I think we're probably across the board, Gen G and G2, top two. So who's the next two? Uh, Dignitas and Space Station. I think Space Station will get a more favorable bracket. I really trust Sad Jr. I think they got solid pieces, and they seem more consistent than M80, so I'll, I'll put Space Station. Jens? I have to agree with that. I think definitely Dignitas is one, two plays there. Um, Space Station, yeah, I can see M80 making it over them, but all in all, yeah, I think Dig- Dignitas and Space Station are very solid picks for that top four. Yeah, I like these three that you guys have brought up, but I'm actually going to switch it. I'm going to go with um, Space Station and M80. 
Um, I like this dig team, and I think you're right. They definitely have made a surge forward. I do think that this M80 squad, I, I, I don't really have any logic for it, but I feel like they've got something cooking. You know, Nick seems to find some success when he's on whatever roster. Um, I love the talent on that team. And, you know, I think it is going to take a little bit of time because they all are, are, are players that have not played with one another, not even played, um, you know, a lot against each other in ranked. And so it may take a little bit of time for that style to mesh, but I've got a lot of faith in that team, a ton of talent. So I think, um, I think M80 will continue to put it together. So, all right, there's our predicted top four for NA. Let's bounce to South America. Can Furious strike back? We talked about it last week. Furious seemed to be the uh, community favorite for South America. There was a lot of hesitation surrounding the complexity roster with the pickup of Dorito. I think a lot of people just felt like, why would you even make a move? Like, that is maybe lateral at best. Um, again, this is community sentiment, not every single person. But there was just some hesitation around that roster. And then here they go. First event in Sam, they take the dub. So uh, what do you guys think about that? And can Fury strike back? I believe so. I think that they already showed they can switch really? complexity. So I think that there's, like, it's not just like, we're like, well, they have more talent. They just need to put it together. No, they've, they've clapped complexity. Yeah. Like, it's, there's tape that shows they can do it. Um, so I think just for, because I think it'd be more fun and for the rivalry. And I, I, I'm going to just pick Fury to win because... The content's better that way um i think but i think it's a toss-up um and I'm, and I'm watching i'm watching nip uh just because they had a, a rough call and i they're a young team and i'd really like to see how they're going to bounce back um not to win just how they're going to do throughout the tournament and Didn't then they i'm still take a loss in the they did they lost the 19th seed so that's what i, I want to see i want to see how they rebound from you know probably a loss they didn't think they'd get um, and then I'm, I'm also, I'm still kind of in on crew, you know, me and me and crew, we, we, we do a little flirt. So <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I but I'm going to say Fury, a complexity final Fury wins. Yan tweets out something that's disrespectful and we get <laughs> this fun rivalry continue to go. That's, that's all I want. I want content. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, who can resist King card, right? So crew is definitely a pick for that top four. Maybe. Uh, I can't see uh, Furia or Complexity giving up their spot so easily. Um, and I can't, in good conscience, pick Furia over Complexity after, last reason, uh, after the Grand Finals of last regional. But absolutely they can do it. Yeah. Furia are still Furia. They can absolutely take back that first spot and first seed for the region. No yeah, no question. Yeah, I feel similar. I think uh, I would be uh, on the same wavelength as Michael here. I, I think, you know, I, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was Lost that tweeted out something that there, you know, there were some other things going on as well. He wasn't maybe fully focused. Um, and sometimes that happens, you know, we have things in, in our personal life or, or whatever, something's happening at home. Um, and it's certainly not an excuse. I want everybody to understand this because people talk about this a lot. A reason for something unfolding is not an excuse. They're not excused from losing. They still lost, Nobody. you know, it doesn't matter if there are some other things going on and that those things are important and valid, but it's not an excuse, right? They deserve to lose. They lost, but it could be a reason that contributed to them not performing their best. So with that said, I, I love that Fury roster. I think they're so talented and, uh, you know, I think they will, um, I would predict that they do bounce back in this next regional and take the, uh, championship W. Will anyone challenge the top two in Sam or do we feel confident it's Fury of complexity? I'm going to stick with what I said last last week, and I'll, I'll say, I think maybe next split, but right now, because yeah, I think yeah. I have to unlock. It's just like you mentioned a while back, you know, teams get more replay review, and then things yeah. get weird, and that's why teams make roster changes. But I, I still think Crew has the talent to do it. I think Nip has the talent to do it. I think there's a couple other teams that could pull an upset specifically early in Swiss. Um, but as for now, it just feels like they're a leg ahead of everybody else. So I'll say no for now. I'll yeah. keep with that. Yeah, I would have been more optimistic about other teams beating them before the season started. Mm -hmm. But now what Furia and Complexity have shown, uh, they just look on top. And I, yeah, of course it can change. And it probably will, of let's course. be honest. <laughs> but I can't predict them to not stay on top. Yep, yep. I mean, 100%. I'm just going to retweet what you guys said, and, and we're going to move on to the next one. So Mina. Uh, will Falcons assert their dominance over Mina? Uh, I should say continue to assert their dominance over Mina. Or do we think a Rule 1, Twisted Minds, Infinity 
can trounce them. I'll go first this time. I think Falcons, I think they've got the potential to go nine for nine, or not nine for nine, not six for six again. I, I think they could be perfect this season in regional um, regional wins. Yeah, I mean, the way they played that first regional, it sure looks like that. I, I wouldn't go that far, but I think as of now, it feels like they have everyone else's number. And I think it was a little, I think the infinity kind of inserting themselves into the conversation um, it shows that, and then like, you know, they went seven with rule one and then rule one got smoked. So yeah. I think barring them, just not bringing their game, which is obviously possible, but not something you should bank on. I think they are going to continue to dominate. I think with a regional win, I think it's really important for Falcons to win this regional because if you don't, then things can get a little awkward, especially if you don't reach the final, but I'd be very surprised if they don't. And I think with, this rule one team, it feels like they have a lot to figure out, especially because they kind of formed super late. And so maybe they have the talent to take a few, a couple, a couple series off them. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. I don't know. I think before the season, we had this top two, right? Of Falcons and rule one, and they still are the top two, but it's not so much the top two as it is the top one being Falcons. And with that comes a lot of pressure and a lot of other teams hunting you down. Everyone in the region should be and probably is studying Team Falcons' play style, uh, their mechanics, the passes, their in- infield plays. So I do think teams like Rule One, but especially also Infinity and Twisted Minds, really can put on the pressure and get a win over Team Falcons. I do think yeah. so. Okay, yeah. y'all got like that. I have a little more confidence, I guess, than in, in Falcons remaining uh, dominant than you two do. Well, let me ask this question, because there's now um, two spots in Mina. Surely we all think that Falcons will have one of them. Who gets the second? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the boring answer. I've, I've made too many hot takes in the last few weeks. <laughs> I'm so wrong. I'm going to say rule one. Um, I think what really impressed me in their last regional was that they did have the composure to just, you know, at that point, it's like, oh, my God, like, unsigned team, game seven, like, we're, we're going to get embarrassed. And, and they still have that veteran. They have a really, really nice veteran presence with, with Ahmed and, and Khaled. And then I think Nupo's still among the most raw, talented players in the world, like, overall. Right? I remember I, saw, I was watching Johnny's watch party, and he named Nupo as the second most mechanical player in the world behind Zen. And that guy, you know, obviously knows yeah. one's player didn't know. So I think that they'll still be able to out-talent a lot of teams in Swiss, which is important because Swiss is where things can get wacky and then like you end up 3-2 and then you're playing a yeah. top team. I think they'll be able to out-talent teams to get that 3-0, maybe 3-1, every single regional. And I think that's going to do wonders for them, like getting those top fours, getting those top mm-hmm. twos, uh, getting easier paths. Because like Twisted Minds and Infinity had to play each other in the first round last, last uh, qualifier. So yeah. you know, being able to avoid those weird matchups I think are quite important. Yeah, what they could have against them is that they're more known, a more known quantity than a team like Infinity. Um, so they don't have as much of a surprise factor to them. And Infinity can use that in their favor, for example, to beat Rule 1 earlier in, let's say, a quarterfinal, and then really get ahead of them in the points. But they have Nupo, so yeah, they're top two. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I feel the same. I do think that uh, I do think that you have like Falcons one, and then you have like a this next tier with Twisted Minds, Rule One, Infinity, and, and I think we can throw probably throw Fearless in there as well. We'll see if they can consistently yeah. um, perform like that. But I do think that I would put Rule One at the top of that tier, um, and I and I think that they, like you guys said, they have the talent to break out of that and and, and jump into that S tier with Falcons as well. But they got to show it first. Um, so we're all we're all in agreement. Falcons rule one, top two for Mina. Let's move over to OCE. Will the Chiefs make land race interesting, or any other teams for that matter? Or are we going to see Power Pioneers secure things once again in the Oceanic region? Um, I I mean, look, I, the Chiefs are so weird. Like <laughs> they just, I look at their I look at their roster. I'm like, this is the by far the most mechanical team in the region. Like they can all make plays. 
but then it's just like there's it's it's like miss they're like a little mini liquid where it's like you're playing yeah, you're watching them play yeah. and you're like you should be for owing this team and you're not and it's annoying so i i'm gonna say that the chiefs can and the chiefs should make land like they are so talented as as compared to the rest of the region um but i have I have like no, I don't have any faith that they're gonna figure it out in time for this this major, in in specific maybe next major. I mean, you look at Ground Zero uh, last year with Lockie, where you know th- he joined them and then they immediately came alive. And I thought that was gonna happen with Chiefs too, and it just hasn't. So, just I want to say yes, but I feel like they're not gonna do it because they should be dominating. Like I mean, maybe not dominating, but they sh- it shouldn't look like like power shouldn't look so ahead of them and the rest of the region, but they just seem to understand the game so much better with Fever and Torsos, where it, it's it's hard for me, and then you know, Banana Head's playing so well. It's just hard for me to see... Yeah, I, it's hard for me to see Chiefs pulling it together, because they, they they were getting scares in in quals, and it's just like... I, I, I just... I can't put money on it. I can't put my faith in them. It feels like kind of what you're talking about with Sam, where maybe in split two... You know, mm-hmm. maybe they have some time throughout one. They they sure. figure out the you know where they're going wrong. Maybe they build mm-hmm. a little bit of confidence. I'm sure the power and pioneers orgs just kind of feel like it's just hard to overcome them in that OCE region. They're they they have always been, and it feels like maybe they always will be. Um, so I, I mean, I feel similar. I think they, they they've got a lot of talent, but for this one, it doesn't feel like they're going to be able to threaten that that top top two or take it away from either of those teams. I feel yeah. You know, fairly confident that Pioneers and Power. Will that's probably... the thing, right? When you only have two land spots, you need mm-hmm. to be there from the start. You need to get yeah, that's right out of the gates with a strong start, and that's not what they could do. And then you only have two thirds of the split left, and that could just not be enough. So maybe even because of that reason, maybe they could do it like with their current team strength, but they've wasted a third of their split. So maybe that's even a reason why you could say yeah. maybe next split because this this is not something not a start you want to have if you want to make that land race interesting it's definitely cutthroat in uh not only in oce but also in apac we've only got one spot over there and we had the i think you know widely regarded as the top team with the gladiators uh bert and realize returning and this time adding max you in place of kami but they fell out of the event fairly early, actually. Um, Elevate's new squad with Sphinx, Kevin, and help me out. LCT. LCT. LCT, thank you. Another legend there in APAC. Um, they got the court, the first win for qual number one. Question is, can Elevate bounce back here in qual two and set up a do-or-die event in qual number three versus Elevate? Yins, what are you thinking about the APAC situation? Um... Can Gladiators bounce back? I don't... Mm. I mean, can they? Yeah. Will yeah, they? Yeah. It's a different right. different question, huh? Um, again, just like, like you said, in OCE, it's kind of the same story, even though there's only one uh, land spot here, where you need that strong start. They didn't get it. It'll be such an uphill battle. Can they do it? Yeah. Will they? I'm going to say no. Michael? Um, so I guess, you know, a little inside, inside information, but I write the topic sheets. And when I said do or die, I actually said that because of, like you said, how hard it is to start. Because if uh, Gladiators are able to win this, I believe it puts them at 24 or 25 points. to get 16 for a win, 9 for the top four. And, you know, that which be, and we can assume that Elevate will be in the top four, right? So even if Elevate make the final, that'll put them at 28, which essentially means the team that places higher, well, or sorry, Gladiators will have to win the next event right? Uh, to make, be able to make the major or make the final, or sorry, or Elevate won't have to make the final. So it will literally be, I think if, if they don't win this event and Gladiators win this event, it's going to be unbelievably hard because they're going to have to count on elevate not even making yeah. i think top four to even make major like they're they just have to take care of business their destiny isn't in their hands mm-hmm. um and i think that will motivate gladiators i think now sometimes with these teams that come in as preseason favorites they yeah. oh they kind of buy into their own hype a little yep. bit and then Absolutely. they get punched in the mouth and then they're back against the wall and that's when we really see who teams are and i believe in this team because it happened to them last year 
when they didn't make the winter major. And they came back in the spring major and they t- took a game off Vitality. And then obviously at the World Championships, they were uh, really, really competitive in the wild card. Um, so I'm going to say yes. I believe that this team is built for these sort of situations. They're prone to buying into their own hype a little bit, but they always respond. And so I'm going to say they're going to win this event and they're going to set up one heck of an APAC regional to end this split. I am with Michael. I want the content. I also believe that squad's got, I mean, Realize has been the APAC guy from the inception. Um, I think Vert has done a great job as well and throwing Max U in there. Um, you know, off to a rough start, but I do believe they can uh, can bounce back and get a dub here. And then, like you said, it all comes down to that final event. Uh, basically, who who can outperform one another in that third qual to uh, potentially grab the spot. So, APAC, interesting at the moment. Certainly not the way that we all predicted it would go. Now, let's move on to SSA and Will Limitless hold home court once again. Last uh, last qualifier, they did have to face off against one of the European teams that is queuing the SSA region. And they held them off, and they actually worked them pretty easily. It was a 4-0 sweep, and as we as we said last week, um, you know, it was not really close score lines. They they handled it fairly uh, confidently. Do we think that they will do so once again in qual number two? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I th- I think we can finish it with that. They're going <laughs> to the next still. Bit. I mean, no, but the thing the thing is, I do think that that Young Money Clan probably is like their toughest competition, um, whether it's from SSA or beyond. And, you know, I didn't even get to watch, but it seems like Limitless, you know, on their home ping is just not really going to have a problem. I think they may be equal to or, or even like levels above that, that squad. Uh, because, again, you look at those score lines and it just doesn't even look, it really doesn't look competitive. It's also personal. Like That's the right. SSA community is like they've been very vocal about how they feel. And Limitless clearly feel that they are the representation that, hey, we are not a free region. You can't come in here and walk to free land spots. And they're and they're and and I so I think they're playing with extra motivation. And where in the first regional, maybe you thought they'd overdo it because of that. Sure. They show that they come in, they're cold, they're calculated, and they run you out of this region. And I love That's that. It. And I think it makes it incredible. <laughs> yeah. They're There's a good chance court. they'll come up against an EU team in the grand finals of the next event as well. And I believe they once again will just take care of business. Uh, that's what they did last time. I, yeah, they are so motivated to show it again. Yep. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's jump into our next segment. We've got a segment called Silence the Doubters, and here's how it's going to work. Uh, each of the three of us will be giving a pep talk to a player or a team that was underwhelming in Qual 1 and make a promise that they will silence the doubters. Yeah, so well, I, I can start. Okay. You start. I'll, awesome. I'll kick us off here. Um, I'm just going to go with, uh, you know, I'm most familiar with North America and Europe. That's what I just have the most time to dedicate to. Um, so I'm going to go with OG. OG. They had a very rough qual one. Um, and I think that there is, you know, I think different players respond to these kinds of situations in different ways. But that team was just a, they were a, a unique occurrence where they were all three kind of left out of their former rosters. All three still pretty good players, but also all three served like in different ways, but similar roles to their team where they were certainly not like the standout um, stat uh, acquiring player. They were not the superstar. Um, I think all of them have great mentality and they landed a very prestigious org. And when you do, I think you also want to prove to the org, hey, you made a right choice. You want to prove to the people that left you out, hey, you made the wrong choice. And maybe, I, I don't know, but maybe that got to them. Maybe they felt you know, too much pressure potentially put on themselves by themselves. I'm not sure. But I do think that that team is way better than what we saw. I think they will more times than not comfortably qualify. I think they will more times than not push deep into the Swiss stage, potentially even make top eights more times than not um, when it's all said and done. But I don't think that going 0-3 is that team's mantra. I don't think that's what's going to happen. So I believe that the people that have seen one performance, one poor performance uh, from OG, that have written them off and said, you know what, they're probably that's probably where they're going to sit somewhere from 15 to 24 throughout the season. I don't think so. They are going to be better than that. I think they're going to go top 11, top eight more times than not. I truly believe that that OG squad still has some fight in them. Um, J Nabs, Nolly, and Com are solid players, and I think they're going to prove that here in Qual Two. Love that. Um, so my pick, I'm going to address the camera. Joris, look at me. You and me right now. You have eyes? There's no one else here, okay? Yeah, I do. 
and I only have eyes for one Dutchman. Okay, Doris, you hear the noise. You hear that they're calling you a Swiss merchant. Mm. You even acknowledged it. Mm-hmm. And, you, and you looked unbelievable in that Swiss stage. And then you came up against a team that, by the way, did not even make the regional this time around, and they ran you off the floor. You made them believe. You made everybody believe that what they were saying was right, except for me. I see you for what you are, and that is an incredible player. And you can't buy into this Swiss merchant stuff. So I am betting on Joris to silence the doubters. I think even though I didn't pick them to go top four, which is probably a bad look now that I'm doing this, I, I think that they're going to show they're going to show a lot more fight. They're going to show a lot more grit in those playoff matches. And I believe that Joris is still has that talent that we pegged him to have all those years ago when he proved it when he was putting up 2.0 ratings in LAN environments against Semper Esports. I believe in Joris. I believe he's going to silence the debtors, and I can't wait to see him show everybody that he is so much more than a best-of-five guy. All right. Beautiful. Amazing. Well, my pick is from South America, and I'm going to cheat just a little bit um, because my team didn't actually underperform they were just incredibly unlucky. I'm talking about Gamer Legion, who had to mm. forfeit their regional in the Swiss stage. They were two and one. They uh, could have, I think, easily beaten Shaman Esports to go three and one uh, and into the playoffs. They didn't because Pan had to evacuate for the Chilean wildfires. I believe that he has tamed those wildfires and he is taking them with him to the playoffs and i believe that game religion out of all these hyper competitive teams in south america are the ones that want it more Mm. Mm. love it and everybody knows when you want it more that's how you get the dub that's it incredible stuff well hopefully these players and teams will silence the doubters this upcoming regional, <laughs> qual, whatever. Major so we got another one segment here called Park. Speed Taking. Not speed dating, speed taking. And you may be wondering, well, what, what is that? Well, here's what's going to go down. We take some hot takes from the Shift Discord. All right? If you're not in there, get in there. It's the Shift Core. There's all kinds of fun discussion about rosters, performances, et cetera, going on in there. Pros as well. So you might get, you know, you might get some back and forth with some of your favorite players. And we take some of the, um, we grab some of those takes and we're going to check them out here on the show and we are going to rate the take or respond to the take in about 30 seconds or less. So it's going to be speed taking, all right? Let's who do wants, it. Uh, who wants to go first? I can, I can go first. Okay, go Michael's going to go first. We'll go, we'll go all the way around and we can end with you. And here's, here's what I'm going to do because I know, I guess I'm, gotta, I'm kind of in control, I'm going to cheat. I know that all of us have this docket. I'm just I'm not gonna go in order. I'm just gonna bounce around and give you one. So oh, let's sure. do it. Keep me on all my right. toes, Hootie. Okay. I know, gotta keep you, gotta keep you ready. Take from the shift cord. NRG has downgraded in every move since Frosty. How do you feel uh, about that yeah. take? I agree. Um, you know, I think Toasty is really good. Uh, I don't I know it didn't work, but you know, I know. Fun fact is that Dries has made... I, I, I'd always like freaks me out that Dries has made four majors because it feels like he's always been sort of in that right under it. But I think Frosty showed that with a little more time, and I'm sure there were like team issues or whatever, but with a little sure. more time, he could have been exactly what that team needed. I think they prematurely uh, dropped him. I think they could have worked things out, and uh, I think they're suffering because of it. Okay. We'll, th- we'll throw to Yins next. Let's say... Hmm. Let me, let me see... Shuffle I'm going to give you this one. Vitality right. make a roster move if they fail to make major one grand finals. That's the take. What you think? I don't yes, it. no? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Rodosin has a contract extension until uh, the end of the year. And uh, we've seen it before with top French teams. We've seen it with VDS uh, that they just bench players, even though the contract's still up for like a year and a half. Mm-hmm. I think they have to work on their play style, but it's not a problem of the players on the team. Do um do one of you want to throw one at me or or I could I got you, own. I got you. Okay. All right. Hootie. All right. Here's your take. 
Farah is the best coach in Rocket League history, yes or no, and why? Yes. The coach role is one that is um, behind the scenes, but it's one that I am extremely passionate about. You got to talking about coaches earlier, and I could go on for 30 minutes to an hour about the position um, at the team level, at the eSport level, this entire environment. So, um, and I, I, that's what I started doing. I wanted to be a coach. I wanted to coach at the RLCS level. So I'm, I'm, I'm hyper aware of it um, to the degree that I can be. They do obviously operate behind closed doors. But I think when you've got a player that has so, uh, excuse me, a, a coach that has so many players um, saying that he is easy to work with, he is respectful, he is, uh, you know, articulates himself well, he inspires them, encourages them. And then somebody that has the intelligence to pull something as magical as what he did to somehow convince American fans to cheer for a European team, I think that alone solidifies him as the best coach ever. Uh, I mean, an incredible thing. And then, listen, the guy moves teams, and he's still winning. He just doesn't lose. The guy is a legend. He uh, He's also, you know, somebody we're going to talk a little bit more about here in a moment. He's willing to be vocal and use his voice for good. I think that he truly cares about RL Esports. Um, it's just a, a, an awesome figurehead for the scene. So my, 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 uh, my rating of that is 10 out of 10. Great take. It's not just Hoodie saying it either, because... Fatira came out saying that oh, even yeah. though Eversex, who is a great coach, even though he is a great coach, he said, Farah is the best coach he's ever worked with. So that's... And, you know, uh, we're going over 30 seconds here, but I think uh, Farah is responsible for part of why Zen integrated so seamlessly. You know, yeah, I mean, absolutely. that is a, an incredible 100%. talent and, and a team that was a pretty good team. And then they just went <laughs> straight to the top. So I think, uh, yeah, Farah, incredible stuff. All right, let's keep it rolling. We're going to go back to Michael. Uh, Moist is clearly Europe's number five team. Wow. Oh, <laughs> How far we've like fallen, haven't we? No, I mean, listen. <laughs> I still believe. I didn't think they played particularly well at spots. Obviously, they had to reverse the sweep, reverse sweep the Swiss. Yeah. But uh, if you watch the series against Vitality, Vitality wasn't that great, uh, you know, in Vitality Sure. To vitality standards. Yeah. Uh, and but the 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 series was closer than the scoreline showed. Uh, the four one scoreline showed. I thought Joyo still is an absolute freak show. Um, the guy is. You know, I think when you have a talent like that, you always have a chance. And uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say. I think they're clearly at least the fifth best team. I, I think that the other teams aren't as good as they they are for sure. Um, but I still think they can move up. I'm kind of like I'm. I'm okay with abandoning some of my takes, but that one I'm, I still kind of want to. I still kind of want to see it. I'm gonna let it play out. All right, let me throw one at Yens in here. G two can beat any team in the world on their day. I knew it. I knew you'd throw that one to me. I had to. <laughs> I just had a feeling. Um, <laughs> what to say? I mean, of course they can. There is never a hundred percent chance. Uh, someone's going to win or lose. It's Rocket League. But just mm -hmm. taking the take at face value, G2 can beat any team in the world on their day. No. Ooh. No. Th no, they're amazing in NA, but they're amazing in NA. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're going to have some Can I just say something quickly? I, I will, this is my defense, my North American defense, even though I've been called defeated. I think when I was watching Gentlemates run, I was like, well, you know, if G2 kind of like <laughs> won in seven against Vitality and they kind of threw and then they lost in six to Carmen Corp, I'd be like, yeah, I, I could see that happening. Like, so I'm like, you know, I think they can be in that class just because I think that's a reasonable result of the land for G2. So I'll just leave that there. But uh, Hoodie, here's your, here's the last take. Um, and it is, for you, it is the top four in Europe this weekend will be the four that we see at Major One in to-be-disclosed location. Signed to Oxygen, so it pains me to say this, but yes, I do think that is going to be the top four. I'm going to be totally honest and say, if you don't have that take right now, it's just copium or you haven't watched. Those four just look clear. It, they look clear. And listen, there's nobody... That would be happier if something changed, if Oxygen excelled and, and, and went up to the top four. I would be thrilled. But mm -hmm. I don't see how I could make that take right now. Top four in Europe this weekend, those French powerhouse teams just look way better 
the level of Rocket League that we saw from semifinals forward was just unreal. Um, I mean, we saw all of those talent jumble up, right? We saw another one thrown in, the mix, uh, Drolly. And, I mean, they're just continuing to roll. I think Europe's going to have, uh, you know, not only are those going to be the top four at the major, I think that, uh, or the four representing Europe, I think that very well could be the top four at the major. The level is so high. It, it's it's so hard it's to bet against them. Yeah, absolutely. Beast All right, so that's going to close man. our segment there of speed taking. Let us know what you think. If you agree, you disagree with some of the takes that you saw here from the shift court, or if you disagree or agree with us as well. And leave Enjoy. some takes as well if you That's want. right. Join the Discord, Join that shift Discord, go to the Rate yeah. My Take channel, and there's oh, also okay. a thread in the channel where you can discuss it with everyone, uh, well, and you I can upload and downvote the takes. I fight that wars shift cord that link anyway. will be in the description as well, so check it there. Join the Discord and get involved with the discussion. Final thoughts here as we close things out. We had all kinds of stuff to talk about around the world, and now we have seen the Qualifier 1 conclude for every single region. Every team, every coach, every player has felt the impact of the changes uh, format-wise from last season to this season. And there have been some discussions about that on social platforms. We had a take on Twitter from the Rebellion CEO. And if you may be wondering, um, you know, what, why is that relevant? Well, Shopify Rebellion goes top four in their uh, first event here for North America, the Qualifier 1. And then, well, they fail to make it in Qualifier 2. They're not even in the event. So we've got some extreme volatility. And listen, I want to make this very, very clear. You know, Michael looked at the camera. I'm going to look right at you. We are not claiming that the format is unfair. The format is fair. All of the teams are operating under the same system. And they know what that system is prior to the season beginning. The format is fair. That is not the criticism. Capiche, we got it. It is not gotcha. about it being unfair, okay? Just because a format is fair doesn't mean that it's exempt from criticism. There are things that we could do to improve the Rocket League eSport and the ecosystem to make sure that all people are being cared for in a manner that uh, you know makes sense. Here's what I'll say before we even read these out. The organizations pay their rosters anywhere from 5 to $35,000 a month. All right? Per player, we're talking. Oh, no. Well, yeah. Well, roster, roster. Per roster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah per roster. Five is... grand to 35000 per yeah. roster. I mean, players, yeah. you know, they're making anywhere from two grand up to twelve grand. you know, and, and some may be making more per month, but I don't know. But it's you, my point is it's a significant investment. Okay? Now, let's also think about what are some things that they may get back. Because ultimately, organizations are a marketing tool. It's a way to advertise sponsorships, etc. Um, that is kind of the, the general revenue stream for esports. So they get esports decals. That's great. That's an awesome upgrade uh, from the past where we didn't have that. It's a way for organizations to earn on that investment of team. Uh, they have usually have contracts where they make a sliver of the prize earnings. So when your team gets first place, let's say you win 10 grand, the org may take 1500, right? Um, so there's a couple of your main re ways that orgs will earn uh, or get some return from their investment. Uh, I'm sure there are more, but I'll, I want you to think about this. The other thing that they get is it's not really measurable, I guess, but it's just brand awareness, right? So when your team is on the mainstream, that's great for your org. You get to represent those brands. Um, people may Google, who is G2 Stride? Why are they saying stride, right? So you you can understand how these orgs get a kickback, okay? But think about this. The mainstream, the only way you're guaranteed is if you're top eight. So you could be a top 16 team all season long, and there's no guarantee that you're going to be on the mainstream, right? Secondarily, and this is a big, a big issue in my opinion, esports dynamic, power dynamic is so, um, I would just call it broken. Because the orgs pay these players bukus of dollars, and the orgs ultimately don't really have a lot of power. If these players, who, by the way, are 13 to 24 years old, if they don't get along, that $30,000 investment could be down the drain. Think about, and I, you know, I hate to call specific examples, but Shopify Rebellion bought Team Flight back in the day with Rapid Memory Beast Mode, and they didn't last, I don't think they lasted a full split. It was one they, tournament. It was one tournament. And then you had... I mean, let's be honest. Beast Mode is the reason they bought that team. 
ends up leaving. Retiring. Okay? And so these orgs are taking immense risk. They are throwing all these dollars at these players, and, you, and, you, and you're thinking like, well, why does it matter? If the players, if the players aren't getting play, uh, paid, the eSport is not going to be as competitive as it is. Okay, it's not going to feel as exciting as it is. All right, so all pieces are necessary for this whole system to work, right? And right now, the security uh, that the organizations had from last season, all it was is your team could earn an auto-qualifying spot into the main event by performing good enough to have the most points uh, or the top eight points in the region. That is, this is the thing. I keep talking about this on my stream and people are like, well, teams don't deserve a free spot. I'm like, it's not a free spot. You they earn that spot by being top eight in the region consistently. That is a reward for your consistent performance better than or, or as the top half of that region. And I think that's a fantastic reward to provide a little bit of security for those organizations that are taking massive, massive risk. Okay. And we have ripped that security away as well. Now, I told you to put a pin in that discussion point earlier. We have orgs, and we're going to call specifically the French orgs, the European teams. Those orgs are directly responsible for 4x the viewership. 4x the viewership. NA didn't even break 100K, and the European regionals are rivaling world championship LAN numbers. And I'm telling you right now, I am confident in this. If we continue to rip away security from orgs and make them take on more and more and more risk, they're going to bail. They are going to bail. They are not going to continue to sit here and pour money into this, pour their viewership into this, pour their audience into this, continue to invest in this thing if you cannot give them something. All right? And it's and not a guarantee. No this, is not, this is not a franchise league. It's not the same thing. You're providing security to teams that earn it by being top eight. So um, let, me, let me take a, a quick moment, and I will read out the um, post from the Rebellion owner, founder, and he says, complaining about the RLCS format after we had the worst single-day performance since we entered Rocket League is pretty lame. We were bad. Teams were good. They move on. We don't. It's fair. And I, I got full respect for that. That's what we talked about earlier. The format is not unfair. But he follows up with a secondary tweet, and he says, but when you combine the impact that one bad day and how it cascades across the rest of the year, plus the issues with Blast, plus the admins and lack of an esports team at Epic, yeah, it makes it pretty difficult to invest in Rocket League long term. And, it's and sad that's, uh, because I love this game. That's and that, somebody, is, that is dark. That is scary to me. Yeah, that's somebody that... You know, Rebellion has spent two years mm -hmm. now slowly investing and in growing their Rocket League program, right? Like, this isn't a team that got in because they wanted a decal and they picked up a top team. Like, this is, a, this is a, an organization that clearly believes in the game, oh, yeah. which is why it's so disheartening because they've spent, you know, two, three years toiling in the bubble, waiting to grow and, and build the right roster, build the roster the right way. And so, you know, when, it's, when a team with a philosophy like that is suddenly faced with the, the idea that everything they've built has now kind of taken a massive step back, right? Like, they were, they had gone from a team that was barely making regionals, and they picked up two-piece, and they were, you know, sort of a competitive regional team that would make top eight here and there. And you pick up Justin, potentially the most iconic Rocket League player ever, right? Who still has a ton in the tank. You make top four. You beat a great team in M80, right? You sweep, you sweep Dignitas. You know, the, the feeling in that office or virtual office or wherever they work had to be incredible. Like, we did it. We did it the right way. Mm -hmm. And then the team has an off performance, and now you basically have no chance of going to the major. You probably, unless you have a great second split, can't get to Worlds, even if you make yep. the second major. Um, the season is, a, is essentially, you know, it, it could be done for you, right? I mean, obviously, you still play it out, but your chances of that with how short, uh, how small the World Championships are now have completely fallen off. And... um I think one of the things that I think about is, um, you know, we talked about how it's not, it's, it's not unfair and it's not unfair, but in terms of competitive integrity, I don't That's think right. Epic thought about the long-term effects of competitive integrity with a format like this, because these are young kids. And when young kids realize that they have no chance of making the world championships and no chance of making the majors in these fourth, fifth, sixth regionals, what's going to happen? You're going to see teams half 
passing it. Sorry. Yep. You're going to see teams, you know, hours low, not scrimming. Well, it doesn't matter, especially if they're on sign. Well, it doesn't matter because we can't even make it. And all of a sudden, you know, you're getting random teams making regionals. There's no continuity. Um, there's no real reason for the for any organizations to support the bubble because the bubble's essentially their season's over by April, right? And so I think when people complain about, well, you know, they just have to beat the teams. That's true. But also, what happens when they realize it doesn't even matter if they beat those teams in front of them? What happens when they realize that all that hard work, unless they're you know naturally driven, it's for next year? And we have a four-month offseason. So why would I, you know, I can grind all offseason. I'm going to take it off and collect paychecks. And so I think that's far more of an issue than people are highlighting, is that you're actually creating more problems with, you know, stability within the eSport by making it so tough to consistently make qualifiers and consistently make main events and mm-hmm. consistently make lands. And that's going to scare orgs away. Orgs don't want to take a chance on a young team full of talent like the snowmen. If they know that a bad day for the snowmen is their chance of getting exposure at worlds, their chance of naming rights, their chance of this, that, and the third going out the window. Why would you invest in that? That's a bad investment. Yeah. That's the um, thing. It's not unfair to the players, to the teams, yeah. to the competition, but it right. is unfair to the orgs and standing up for the orgs is not, the most, uh, you know, <laughs> favorable thing. I mean, obviously, some orgs make terrible decisions as well, and um, they don't always have the support from the whole community behind them, but they are a very necessary part right. of the ecosystem, of the esports industry. And you can see how important they are when it comes to the the creator-owned esports organizations like Moist Esports, like uh, Carmine Corp, like Gentle Mates, like all these others bringing in a third, a quarter of the viewership or in, in, in this 400k regional, I mean, yeah, more than half are going to be tuning in to see those teams play. And if they, because it wasn't only the uh, Shopify Rebellion yeah. founder, but also the CEO of Carmine Corp, saying something along those lines. Maybe, maybe you want to say something about it, Hoodie. Then, and his team won. And, and, and his, his team won. won. And yep. the very respected coach, Farah, who we just talked about, is most likely the best coach in all of Rocket League, uh, saying the same things, to, you know, shedding a light on all these uh, issues with the roster, with the roster, with the format. Um, that's... I mean, it's good that they're saying it because they're the people who actually, you know, get the support from the community mm-hmm. and people take notice when they say things. That's right. And, and I One think a lot thing. of people, I think a lot of people are interpreting the criticism as like copium oh. that your favorite team didn't get in. And it's so much less about like what actually occurred even. It's more so about like what precedent this is setting, what system this is setting and the longevity of this esport. Because again, like Jens alluded to, each piece is vital. If you have players and consumers, but no orgs to pay players, here's what's going to happen. The competitive, uh, uh, you know, the competitive integrity is going to fall off. The, the level of competition is going to fall off. And guess what happens? Viewers don't watch as much. It's not as fun, right? These orgs also provide storylines. I mean, how fun was it to see Itachi or Exotic play their former team in KC, right? Especially when you have crazy big audiences that follow these orgs and now follow those storylines as well. And again, it's so much more than just like, it's unfair that Rebellion didn't make the uh, regional. It's unfair that Snowman didn't. It's not, it's not about that. It's about the implications and the repercussions of these decisions and the ripple effect it will have across the ecosystem. And I think that is the thing. Like you cannot... Look at it through a microscope. You have to look at the full picture and understand, like, what, what does this change? What does it mean on a, on a greater scale over two, three, four years? And I think 100%. right now we're seeing these. And listen, this, this is a CEO addressing a specific thing that happened. There was Space Station CEO, NRG CEO. There were other people talking about this before the season occurred because they saw what this format would mean for their yeah. team. It's nothing new, what they're saying. It's That's just right. who is saying it right now. Mm-hmm. Do you, um, so this, this message from Farah is incredibly well-written and articulated. Do you, do y'all think that it's worth reading out here? 
Um, um, maybe think, you can touch on which topics he discussed. Sure. Yeah. So Farah does put out a long tweet. Um, here's what we can do. We can link it in the description. Uh, definitely go check it out. And I would say if you feel similar to him, engage with it. You know, help it, help it see more people on, on the social platform. Um, he just starts off by saying, hey, at RL Esports, we need to have a talk. Um, addresses the fact that there have been, obviously, changes made from last season to this season. He also understands that it's mostly due to uh, budget constraints and downsizing. And he talks about a few things um, that he has a, a initial concern with. And, and he also says that there are plenty more, but there's not space for it here on Twitter. He talks about, number one, the removal of auto-qualification spots, which is something that we have been talking about and hitting on here. Um, last season, if you accumulated points in the RLCS, the top eight teams um, in points would get to go straight to the main event, right? And then it doesn't stop there. Nine through 16 in points would go to day three of the qualifier. And those are ways to bring a little bit of extra security uh, to those organizations. Again, minimize the risk that they are taking. Um, and I'm going to tell you this. Even with that, they're still taking huge risks. They're still throwing chunks of money at their team with no guarantee for them to get any return on their investment. And listen, that's what they're doing. They understand that as well. But we can try to, you know, minimize that. We can try to, you know, just just take away some of that risk, make it a little easier, incentivize them a bit to continue buying into our esport. He yeah. talks about how having to qualify every event means that the qualification process should be thoroughly fair. It should be solid. You should have, uh, you know, a format in place that will ensure that you end up with the, uh, you know, the format that will do the best at bringing your top 16 teams to that top 16 area. And the format that we have is only a double elimination. By the way, it's only best of three for the first two days anyways. Whereas we have time to how, make it best of five as well. That's right. Because they're split. He's, it's split across three different days. It's not yeah. like we have everything occurring on one day. Perfectly and then he goes doable. on to say, since we are double elimination only, um, the seeding should be a very, very thorough process. Because... And we, I, listen, I, I competed in the NA qual and my team, I'm a GC1. Okay. I'm not, my team got seated 112. Damn. There was a team that went top 32 in qual one and they got seated 234th. I promise that Reason is not MMR, how that should work. Right? <laughs> I benefited MMR? from it. I actually got 128, top 128, by the way. I made some money. <laughs> yeah, Michael, if it comes down to those teams, but. Of course, for Carmen Corp, that's not an issue. It's yeah, more about still, other the reason points. MMR in a in a game. It just shows no presence. Okay, nah, so in, no, Michael, it's that's, not, it's that's not, always is, been the case. It wasn't really? even okay. MMR Michael. for them. They had the same starting three. They removed their sub, and since all of it is automated, they basically got like reseeded as a brand new team. Oh. So their top thirty-two performance didn't matter. And this is what he's talking about. You cannot have a fully automated system where no one is paying extra attention, there's no human input, because you are going to have niche scenarios like that. There are going to be play, uh, players or teams, things that happen where you need human input. You need someone to double check that automated system and make sure, because if you don't, then you have these scenarios. That very team that I just talked about is the one that upset Omelet on day one. Mm -hmm. And now Omelet is in a weird situation from day one, and they're gonna continue to cause weird situations as they go. You have other teams being um, underseated as well. You mentioned Tivaristo. They were seated 300-something. Yeah. That's... Okay? And so this is what Fair is talking about. You have put so much volatility in this system that organizations are, are, are sensing it and feeling it now, and we're only at Qual 2. This is going to continue to happen in every region throughout the world throughout this season. They are just assuming more and more and more risk after pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars across the board into this esport and making this ecosystem what it is and i don't want to call i don't, I don't want to call too much attention to this but there was a tweet from a, a, an employee that works um, with the esports team for psionics epic and they said i'm always betting on rl after seeing the viewership this weekend and i am thinking to myself you need to start betting on these orgs. You need to start betting on the community. You need to start betting on the people that make this esport what it is. Because right now, they have been screaming at you for months on end to listen to feedback, value the feedback. The people that are participating in this are, are, are they're doing everything they can to tell you that what you are implementing may be detrimental. 
and yeah. it is all being ignored. Yeah, and it, think- it's, it's so it's so frustrating to see. And, and maybe I maybe I am misplacing my anger, but to see a tweet like that that's celebrating the viewership while simultaneously implementing rules that are are making it more and more difficult for orgs to justify getting in when the ju- when the orgs are the one that are bringing the viewership. Yeah, I, I want to say uh, I'm. I guess this is technically playing de- devil's advocate, but it won't be by the end. Um, I do understand that Blast was brought in very late, um, and it felt like yeah. they weren't really as involved in the process of the format, um, mm-hmm. it, just due to the fact that it's so similar to the Fortnite one. So it seems like the Epic, that Epic kind of set the table for it. Um, and I, that first of all, I don't know what happened between Epic and ESL, but. I just think it's irresponsible to abandon a production team, you know, two, three weeks before the production begins, because that's just, it doesn't give it, you, you're already placing yourself at a disadvantage. Second thing is, is that I can give a kind of half pass for the format to blast because they weren't able to um, have any say in it, or we assume that so. I don't know if they did, but with the sort of figureheads, space station CEO, Shopify CEO, Carmen Corp CEO, uh, and their public uh, issues, and the fact that they're not only just complaining, they're not just complaining, they're offering solutions. It is completely unacceptable that there is not, if that there are no changes made for the second split. Like waiting till the end of this year and saying, oh, we'll just start again next year, that could have serious issues. Mm-hmm where orgs who don't believe that they have super teams pull out of the game. You know, how is a team like, uh, you know, we, we heard from Garrett who said that, you know, he, he was hearing seven major spots for NA. Um, and whether you agree or not with that many land spots, um, that's the type of thing that a TSM hears and an OG hears and goes, okay, we may not have the best team, but we have a team that can be one of the seven best teams. And then to pull out, switch production teams, and then say, ha, huh, funny, no more World's Wild Card and only four spots each. That's the type of thing that orgs don't forget. And the type of, type of organizers that orgs don't want to work with. Nobody wants to work with an unreliable uh, company as a client because they are essentially clients. Yeah. They're investing money in order to get a product out of it. And uh, t- to me, it, things have to change as soon as possible. Chalk the split, whatever, but it has to change in split two. There has to be some sort of auto qualification. Obviously, the the lands are probably not going to change just because of how far ahead you have to plan them. But the online portion of it, the format has to change or you're going to start seeing orgs pulling out super early. And you're going to see real issues at the bottom and in the bubble where people aren't taking it seriously. Yeah, that's the thing. Changes need to be made because there are flaws in the system. But I don't agree with your take saying that they're clients. Like I said earlier, you have this ecosystem, right, in the esports industry, in the Rocket League esports. And orgs are a huge part of that. And if things are not good for orgs, that's a problem. That's an issue that needs to be fixed. But Cellnex, Epic, Blast, uh, the organizer here, is also part of that ecosystem. And they also have... They also want things to go well. I do believe that nothing they did was to decrease the chances sure. of Rocket League Esports to succeed. So there's lots of flaws right now. And what we need to see is working or is them working on fixes, right? Because and communication. Yeah, communication is one of those flaws. Uh, and we've seen that that's not going as intended as it should be right now because we have seen these CEOs and Ferrari Coach um, saying that communication isn't great either. So they have these issues that, and, and they offer solutions, but there's not many people um, who can listen or who listen to them. And that is an issue more of Epic than anyone else because they fired half the team and made the Fortnite and Rocket League team work together and then also brought in the new tournament organizer of last, last minute. So there's all these things that went wrong, but I don't believe they have to go wrong, continue to go wrong into the future. So while there are flaws right here, every part of the ecosystem is incentivized to 
work on them, to fix them. And that includes Epic, Sonic, Blast, that includes orgs, that includes players, coaches, fans, everyone. We all want this esports to succeed, and I do believe it will. Now is the time to act on the issues that there are this season. And I think Farah brought up a good point as far as some of his suggestions and, and similar with the CEOs is like some of these things don't have to be huge, um, like a cost issue, yeah. you know, making some of these online changes isn't going to cost anything, right? Like we, we can, we can see, we don't, we don't have to like it, but we can see why we trim a split. We can see why we trim wild card. We can see those things. It's a, I don't, again, you don't have to like it, but they had they they made the decision as a business they needed to downsize some of the cost okay sure. but some of these changes uh i i don't I, I don't think it would cost much if any at all to change some of these things that would bring a little bit more security and balance to that ecosystem um that yens is describing um you know we're talking about communication and 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 promptness and and everything else i, I want to remind everyone that um we have a major in like a month, a month and two weeks. Month and a half, yeah. Month and two weeks. No one knows where it is, and to my knowledge, the teams don't either. You know, this is not something where it's public last. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't think the teams have heard anything on their front, and it's just. I want to echo what the Rebellion CEO said. It, it it just makes me sad because how much I care about this game, how awesome the game is, how much potential the game has. It is so easy to understand. You know, my grandma could watch blue team, orange team, ball on a goal. You don't. You don't need to know anything. You know, it is the perfect sport to transcend digital esports and then grab market share from traditional sports viewership. And I'm not saying that we're ever going to rival that. That's not what I mean. But um, Rocket League is suited to do for another time. Yeah, Rocket League is suited to dip into that market, whereas League of Legends is probably not going to appeal to your NFL fan. Um, and it would be too difficult to understand. I don't agree so, with this point. I think Rocket League will always only appeal to Rocket League fans, but. And French okay. people, apparently. Well, I definitely don't agree with that at all. I think it can be super easy to understand and view. And, and, and there are plenty of other competitions that um, individuals don't play and don't enjoy and maybe don't even fully grasp that they can enjoy watching. But we will save that debate. I think that would be a fun topic to go about. That's on. for another time. Yeah. Um, for another <laughs> one, yeah. So definitely some stuff here amongst some rumblings amongst the Rocket League community from organization staff to players to figureheads like us just yapping, to the, the most successful coach at the moment, Farah, delivering a very well-articulated uh, piece as an address to, and, and by the way, he tagged Tim Sweeney, the CEO of Epic. He tagged um, Cliff, I think the director of esports, and he tagged Blast. So he's definitely like aiming this right to the proper people, hoping to have them at least acknowledge uh, the concerns and issues that everybody is feeling right now. So we just wanted to address that and tack that on. Obviously, that's a, a long thing, and we could go on for even longer about that. Um, I would encourage you to look around. You could probably talk about that in the Shift Discord as well. I'm sure there's plenty of Absolutely. places to discuss things oh, like talk that. talk about it. Um, but that's going to do it, guys. I mean, we've made it through. It definitely, like I said, it was a long one today, but we had lots to cover. And I, you know, I imagine it's probably going to be like that every week. There's so much happening each and every yeah. weekend with quals for one region and main yeah, event for another. So. We're gonna I think be we could fill another an entire episode with the <laughs> chaos that NA just <laughs> we could, came up dude. with. And I'm so scared for EU. I'm so scared because the first regional, we kind of made it through pretty smoothly considering yeah, how the format can really That's cause right. chaos. And now it kind of is causing that chaos in NA. But I am scared for EU. There's so many close teams that can fall to each other. And I'm scared. I'm it really is. scared. It's going to be It's going to be intense. Uh, scary, and look, while there are pros and cons to the system, it makes quals entertaining. You know, we're we're going to recognize that as well. But that is going to do it for the shift cast today. Leave your thoughts, comments down below. Tell us what you think about the show. Suggest a topic if you want. Suggest a a, a segment if you want. Get into that shift cord and make Let some uh, you know make some hot takes. takes. We'll check them out on the show as well. Yens, Michael, any closing thoughts? All the top sixteen in this. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Fear the um, dop. I'll I'll uh, upvote or downvote your takes. Uh, just put them in, break my take, and uh, <laughs> I'll see you there. Hey, thank you all for listening to today's Shifts Cast. 
We hope you've enjoyed it, and we'll catch you next week.